weekend, and it was touch and go whether I'd be able to form words in front of you. So uh, I may devolve into Kermit the Frog at some point. Um, but I'm sure we'll make it through together. This section uh, is going to be divided into a few separate parts. There's going to be a wee sort of talk input from myself at the beginning. Then we're going to take a little look around the Sanctuary First website um, for a little, a little bit, see some of the resources that are available for you. Then I'm going to invite a member of Inverary West uh, to come up, and we're going to have a wee quick interview to find out their experience uh, from our host congregation. Then there'll be a couple more thoughts from myself, and then we're going to have an interactive prayer at the end. Okay, um, so that's, that's roughly how this session is going to play out. I'm James Cathcart. I'm part of the Sanctuary First team. I work with Albert Vogel, which is a wonderful roller coaster. <laughs> and uh, a great learning experience. And genuinely, it's so exciting to be working with Sanctuary First because Sanctuary First has such an optimism about the church. And as a young person growing up in the church, I've got a bit fed up with this narrative of decline because I'm still here and the church is still going to be here when I'm older, okay? It's still going to be here. It may not look the same. It may look radically different, but the church has changed so many times throughout its long history and it's not going anywhere. So in my section, throughout the whole thing, I want to look at three C's, community, creativity, and connectivity. And these words have been used so far throughout the day several times. And I want us to keep thinking about these words as key to how we see church and digital technology. Because as has been mentioned several times already this morning, digital technology is a means to an end. It isn't the end in itself. And similarly, church is a means for us to get together. But what that is and what that looks like can change. But what's consistent? Community. What's consistent? Creativity. And what's consistent? Connectivity. So in this first section, I want to focus on community. And I want to say three things about community. First off, we need to stop making assumptions about people who we don't feel are already part of our community. Second off, I think we need to be more open about our whole definition of community and where we draw the lines. And thirdly, I want to encourage us to draw on the strengths of our communities. But before I do that, I want to tell you about my haircut. Not this one. One I got about a year ago. I live in Glasgow, and I went to my local barber in Glasgow. I was getting my haircut. And I don't know about you, but I find the experience of getting my hair cut a wee bit intimidating sometimes. I've got quite a lot of hair, it grows quite quickly, you need to get it cut quite a lot. And there's something about someone standing there with a pair of scissors around your head or the razor or whatever can get a wee bit, a wee bit tense. I'm already slightly on edge. And my barber is quite a tough guy, bald, no neck, talks down like this. And uh, so he's cutting my hair and about halfway through, he says, so, so what is it you do, son? And so I say, well, I'm a writer, I'm a creative consultant. He's like, oh, what, 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 for? what, what is that? Uh, so I go on to explain that I do a number of different things, but part of that is Sanctuary First, which is an online form of church that's part of the Church of Scotland, experimenting with new ways of being church online and helping to resource the wider church. And then there's a silence. <laughs> Not sure how he's going to take that. And then he says to me, so do you believe in the Trinity? Not what I was expecting. Not what I was expecting. I thought you might be making fun of me or going to have a go or something like that. But no, he's asking me about Trinitarian theology. And so I say to him, well, as a, as a matter of fact, I, I do believe in the Trinity. And he says, I don't. Okay, I think, here we go. He's, gonna, he's got an axe to grind. And he says, uh, I don't believe in the big G. And I say, all right, okay, well, I mean, I do, but that's, that's fine. And he says, as uh, so for that Jesus, he's, uh, he's all right, but no, not for me. Good guy, not for me. Good guy, he says. But then he says, see the Holy Spirit. I believe in the Holy Spirit. And then for the rest of my haircut, I got a very interesting, very multi-layered uh, insight into what this Glaswegian barber feels about the Holy Spirit and what the Holy Spirit means to him in his life every day. I had totally underestimated him. 
And I said to him as part of our conversation, you know, it's really interesting that that's the part of the Trinity that you zero in on. Because to be honest, as a person who's grown up in the church, it's the one we don't talk about enough. It's the one we don't recognize enough. We're happy to talk about how great a guy Jesus was and to talk about God, but there's a wee bit of discomfort talking about the Holy Spirit. He was much more comfortable talking about the Holy Spirit than most people that I have spoken to in the past about the Holy Spirit. So the point I want to make is we need to stop making assumptions about people who are outside the church. It's already come up when Albert was speaking earlier about his electrician or the uh, guy at the cider brewery, that people actually are surprisingly interested in church. And for too long, we've assumed that people will only like church if we sugarcoat it. They'll only like church if we give them the version of church we think they like or if we water it down. But not for this guy. This guy was straight in at the Holy Spirit. And what was interesting about that is it made me think differently and expanded my mind. And so this is what I think we need to do. We need to be much more open. And one of the things about digital technology and the numerous connections it allows us to make with other people is that it creates many more opportunities for these kind of things to happen. I think that the church needs to be there. It needs to be clear and it needs to be accessible. And the place to be, to be clear and to be accessible in this day and age is online. We know that people are interested in church. Various attitude studies uh, show that people are increasingly interested in issues to do with spirituality, uh, God, life, death, love. Why wouldn't they be? Why do we think people are not interested in these things? These are the things that matter in life. They just are going about it in a different way. Look at pop culture. Look at the themes that come up in the, your favorite albums, your favorite films. God isn't going anywhere. God has never gone anywhere. It's us who are not turning up. It's us as the church who are so often not part of the conversation. So we need to stop making assumptions about how the community outside needs to change and start thinking about how we perhaps need to change and be open. And part of that is being accessible. And as Jim was saying, having a website. It's simple to do, get up and running, get something started and learn as you go. My wife's from the north of England and she and I have moved up and down several times over the last six or seven years or so. And the first thing we do in a new area is we Google a church to find out where it is. I make myself sound very holy. It's not the first thing I do. Probably the first thing I do is Google where the chip shop is. But the first thing I do when I'm looking for a church is to Google where the church is, right? And so, so often we're missing people. We're missing people because we're not there. We're not accessible. And I've seen a number of websites where the information was incredibly hard to find or, or, the, or in fact, the website itself didn't exist at all. And so I would suggest keep it simple, get started, get something out there and learn as you go. Um, we need to be there so that people can find us. We can use the disruptive power of digital media to bring people to church. We can do that. We can get our message out there. We can advertise what we're doing. We can let people know what's happening and maybe they're going to come to church. But we can also use the disruptive power of social media to bring the church to people. We can offer moments of sanctuary and rest for people living busy, overwhelming digital lives when they need it. I think we need to make sure in terms of our paradigm of thinking about church that it's not just a physical building which we're broadcasting out of in terms of whether it's streaming or other content that we're putting outside. The digital environment is one that we, almost all of us I'm assuming here today, spend a lot of time in. How much time do you spend on your phone? What's the first thing you look at when you wake up in the morning? Is it your spouse or is it your mobile phone, right? Possibly your mobile phone because your spouse might be sleeping. But we spend so much time online and everyone is spending so much time online. In certain ways, the online space is like the market space 2,000 years ago, yeah? It's where people are, it's where people are shopping, it's where people are talking to one another. And it's not something which is separate to normal life. We need to stop thinking of the internet as something that happens out there and people are here. The internet is part of our everyday life, right? A lot of you have traveled probably quite a distance to get here. I assume several of you will have used a search engine to help you find this place, to, to help you with the GPS, perhaps, that sort of thing. Uh, perhaps you booked somewhere to stay, that sort of thing. The internet is part of our everyday lives. So what's exciting about digital media as well is that it's a way of inviting people in to participate and I don't mean necessarily into the building but into our community that offers a low commitment or rather um, has only a low commitment. 
Too often in the past, church has had an incredibly high barrier of what one should look like, what one should wear, what one should, uh, how their deportment should be, how one should behave in order to be part of church. And so many cultural things and so much cultural baggage has got bundled up into what it is to be church. And digital technology, its disruptive nature, gives us the opportunity to turn those things on their heads, to say church isn't what you think it is. Church is not what you have the baggage with. And so moving on to my second point about being open, I think we need to be open in terms of our communities and not see ourselves as we isolated churches who will use digital technology to reach that person who's over there or reach that person who's over there. Instead, see our community growing and expanding as we go online and see the digital community, the people who start participating in our church or our community, whether it's through a service or a clip or prayers or blogs or anything like that, as part of the community. Neil, who spoke to you uh, earlier, Neil McLennan of Sanctus Media, um, uh, was very helpful for me in terms of the language that we use to refer to this kind of thing. Because when I first started working with Sanctuary First, I used the phrase virtual quite a lot. And I would say, what about the virtual congregation? What about the virtual audience? And Neil informed me that there's nothing virtual about someone who's sitting on their sofa joining you. The connection may be digital, um, and there may be um, different aspects to how we're brought together, but the people who are involved are not virtual. And we need to stop kind of thinking about people who are joining us online or participating in what we do online as in some sense virtual, in some sense not a full person, because of course they're a full person. It's just how we connect with people. As we've discussed today, digital, using digital media is not without its challenges, but we're shaped by those challenges. And as Jim was discussing, and in terms of just having a go and getting stuck in, I think it's important that we're vulnerable. And you were saying, Jim, before about how people liked some of the rough edges and they liked some of the, the wee points of entry and the wee points in. We don't have to be experts. We don't have to get this right. But I think we can be mavericks, but we can be vulnerable mavericks. There are lots of issues when it comes to using the internet. And you know, we've touched on several of them today. But another one perhaps we've not thought about today is the fact that so much of what's on social media is very sensationalized. And there's a sense in which a lot of the, there's a lot of skepticism now around the idea of fake news and can you believe what's out there. And there's also a sense that a lot of what's put out on the internet is giving you an idealized version of something. And so I think there's a real exciting opportunity for the church to enter into that space and be real and to be present and to offer people something that really engages them, that stops them in their tracks, that says it's okay to be you. It's okay to feel the way you do. So moving on to the third point about community, I think we need to make sure that we're drawing on the strengths of our community. In order to be active and engaging online, you need a variety of content. Um, there are various things that have been discussed uh, this afternoon and this morning, and you might feel like your church wants to experiment with this aspect or that aspect, and that's great, and you don't have to do everything at once, but I would encourage you to see anything you do online as part of a package. You know, so if you're going to stream services, you should have a website. If you have a website, you probably should have a social media, and that doesn't mean it has to all happen overnight, but imagine it growing slowly. Use the resources in your community. We're going to, uh, in a moment, um, have a look at the website. But, and you can see some of the examples of different types of content we put online. But there was a point made earlier by someone asking a question about audio content. And something that's interesting is that the future of the internet, in many ways, when you think of the virtual data assistants that um, you see adverts for all the time, I'm trying not to mention specific brands, um, uh, is very much the future of the internet is audio content. More and more people are going to be accessing the internet through audio content. And so it's useful to have video content, and we definitely want to have video content, but it's worth also exploring how do we make audio content that's online. So there's things like podcasts and other recordings that you can do. And as part of this, as well as drawing from our local communities, we also need to draw on the much wider community that we're all a part of. We don't have to do everything. And if you see another church in your local area or somewhere else in the country or even another part of the world doing something that's of value, do share it. Do actively share it and engage with it. If you're an individual that's wanting um, to put something out there, then you as an individual have to engage with it yourself. 
um, and you have to make sure that you're sharing it with other people. Because the way the internet works is it's almost like things be sort of gain capital or they gain worth through the layers of connections. So the more that we connect to one another, the more that we share one another, the more likely a search engine or a social network is going to prioritize that information because there's several layers of people all joining together. So you might have one wee drop in the ocean, but it might be somewhere on the other side of the world that sees that, that shares that with someone else, that shares that with someone else. Kind of like the six degrees of separation idea, that we're actually all fairly connected, but we need to do the work. You need to sort of start that process of engaging and sharing. So if you see something that Sanctuary First is doing and you want to share that, please do. You're very welcome to. If you see something that another church is doing, do so. If you have something that you're doing that you want to reach a wider audience, offer um, offer that for other people to share. A little post from your church could be exactly what someone needs to hear. Before I take a look at the website, I would like to give you a word of encouragement. We are good at this. The church is good at this. When you look at church history, it has been members of churches, members of faith communities that have often been at the forefront of using technology. And when you compare the church to other organizations, even right now, today, the amount of volunteers that we can pull on, the amount of passion that we can pull on, it's big. I think there's too much negativity about this idea of declining numbers and declining attendance. Our opportunities to connect with people is growing exponentially. Every day, every day there's another website, every day there's another piece of social media, every day we thicken these connections that we have with one another. We are just limitless how we are uh, increasing our chances for people to become part of church. And so I'm thinking about things like the scroll, the codex, the printing press, literally these digital media technologies were largely carried forth and championed and experimented with and riffed upon by the church. So we shouldn't be timid. We should not be timid. We should be right at the forefront of using this technology. So that's my first C, community. And I'm now gonna move on to my second C, creativity. And for this section, I would like to share with you some examples of things that we're doing at Sanctuary First. And perhaps this could be a starting place if you're not perhaps doing too much digitally at the moment, um, but are keen to try. And what I would encourage you to do is to feel free to use any of the material that we have on our site, but also to adapt it, change it, take it, and maybe think, well, what would our spin on this be? That's absolutely fine. One of the great things about Sanctuary First is that we have a huge amount of flexibility. We can try and fail. We can try and experiment and learn. And so not everything here is going to be pristine. Not everything here is going to be perfectly oiled. But we have the opportunities to try and experiment. And so we would love, we would greatly love for you to see the things we've got and to use them. Um, and this is a sort of offering here of the, of the stuff that we do. Um, but then I would also encourage you to take an inventory of what you do currently and what you would like to do and then think about how you can share that with other people. So with help from the team at the back here, uh, we are going to navigate the site. We're going to go around the site. Uh, so first of all, if I could ask for us to click on the daily worship tab. So this came up earlier today. So every day of the year, we publish a prayer. This is the sort of central part of Sanctuary First that's there all of the time. Uh, there's a title, reading uh, an image. Um, if we just scroll down the page slightly, um, tells you who's written the prayer. Uh, then there's the text for the day. Um, and at the moment, we are drawing from lectionary. Um, we tend to sort of break the Sunday readings uh, in the Revised Common Lectionary over a week and then supplement that with some additional readings. Um, and then below here, you've got a number of options. You can uh, tweet a link to it or uh, connect it with Facebook. Uh, you can also sign up for daily emails. Um, and these are just tags that help people find the content if they're searching for things online. And if we just scroll down a wee bit further, uh, you'll see space for comments. Um, we'd like to build on this. Uh, we find that a lot of the people who access the Sanctuary First prayers um, are fairly quiet. They're not saying that much. And so we are sort of trying to encourage and develop this. So there's a challenge. If you want to read our daily worship, then give us your thoughts, uh, your kind and considerate thoughts, uh, then, then please do. Um, so yes, as I say, that's the central part of what we do. And to give you some of the background to that, we're going to head to the themes tab at the top. And Albert touched on this earlier. 
Um, so what that takes you to first off is the current theme, which is called Songs of Sanctuary. So we might as well stay on that just now. If we just scroll down, a bit of white space here at the moment. So Songs of Sanctuary is our current theme, and how it works is every month we have a new theme. Um, and as Albert was discussing, what happens is he and I will uh, have a look at the readings, and uh, we'll have a look at some of the feedback that we're getting from the wider community of the things they want to explore, and we look for moments of synergy. Um, and we have sort of wider consultation events as well to keep us on track. So this is a kind of blurb here telling you what the theme is about, and the sort of central hook of this theme is looking at songs. Um, because a lot of the readings in lectionary, in the lectionary are about David um, and psalms that, that David wrote. And so the idea is to encourage our writers to look at the songs, the everyday songs that they listen to, love, care, and are passionate about, um, but then talk about that in an interesting way. Um, so if we just scroll up again slightly, um, you'll see on the right-hand side here, there's a couple of resources. If we could click on the first one, um, the resource pack, it's just the arrow, the green arrow, thanks. Um, so this takes you to a PDF, um, which has the same information. And if we just scroll down, just to give you a rough feel, um, that's giving you the basic introduction. But then as you go through the theme, um, it breaks it down for every day. So this is the material that we send to our writers uh, to give them an idea of what we're looking for uh, to write the prayers each day. But this material is online and accessible for anyone to download. Uh, and we're now, I don't know if it's a record, but we're now uh, up to the end of November, which is about as far ahead as we've ever been, uh, and will shortly be to the end of the year until the end of December. So we actually have material uh, based on the readings um, for almost the rest of the year. Um, so if your church is looking for uh, material, perhaps you've got different people leading the services, people are less used to leading the services or perhaps are too used to leading services and could use a wee shake up, then uh, they'd be welcome to check out this resource. And as you'll see, it's pretty minimal. It gives you the reading and a wee prompt. And our, our mantra in many ways is it's better to have a plan than to stick to the plan. Yeah. And I think when it comes to being creative, and we're on the second C, creativity, you often need something to respond against. So we're not too concerned if our writers stick absolutely to the letter on these prompts. The idea is to give them two things that they have to find a point of connection between. So if we can just head back out um, of the PDF here. It's very smooth, this, isn't it? Very smooth. Oh, that's all right. Don't worry. We're just going to get Sanctuary first back up. Um, there's another resource, as well as the resource pack, which is available, um, which is our questions. Um, we have adapted the material every month uh, since, I think, around December last year. It's quite a new thing that we're trying. So if we just head back to the theme page that we were on before, that would be great. Um, and then click the second arrow. Brilliant. That's our discussion questions. Um, we are not as far ahead with the discussion questions. I do apologize, they take more time to develop, so we're gonna have to catch up. Um, but they are available for all of August and shortly for September, October as well. Um, and the idea of this material is to encourage people who are setting up small groups of some kind um, we're starting to use the terminology connect group and we're going to, we've already piloted a few um, uh, local groups with Sanctuary First branding, but we're going to um, launch sort of more on that in the autumn. Um, but it's free to use for absolutely anyone. Um, and the idea is to think again of interesting kind of ways into songs, uh, sorry, into, into the readings. Um, and this month theme's all about songs. So um, we've got the lines from Hallelujah um, and that's why Broken Hallelujah is the um, is the sub-theme for that week. Uh, so we can hop out of that now, that's fine, but it's just to give you an idea of the sort of thing we do. And if we go back up to the themes menu um, and we go to recent themes, that will show you if we just scroll back, uh, just scroll down. Um, these are the past months, so that's back to last Christmas, January, Lent, which is a double theme, uh, Easter, uh, Pentecost, and so on. Um, and so if you want to look back, all the materials there, if you want to look, just sort of scan through uh, to get inspiration on various different things, then feel free to do so. And if we go back up to themes, you'll see uh, on the menu um, the option coming up, upcoming themes. Um, sorry if I'm hitting my microphone there. So yeah, so that shows you your September, October and November um, uh, to give you the information. Uh, so I think we'll move along now and if you go to the video tab, um, bunch of videos on the site, huge number of videos on the site, as Albert was saying, Sanctuary First in its current form is only a couple of years old, um, but actually draws on a much longer tradition. Um, and so there is material dating back a long time uh, on the site. So there are really 
countless videos. Yeah, that's great. If you just continue to scroll down, that's, that's brilliant. Um, so there really are tons and tons of videos. These videos can be downloaded from the site. You're absolutely free to use them. You don't need to credit us. You don't need to tell us. It would be nice if you credited us. It would be nice if you told us. Um, but you do have no requirement to do so. Um, and we won't go to the pages, but if we go to the video tab at the top there, um, you'll just see the options. I say that we won't go just now, but live. So that's if we're streaming an event where we would hit to. Um, and then live watch again, which is a catch up feature um, to, to watch things. Uh, so if we just move along to blog at the top there. I think a lot more could be done with blogs and churches blogging, uh, and not just the minister having their wee letter to the church magazine, but inviting other people, like I was saying, in terms of drawing on the strengths of your community. Um, there might be someone else in your church who's an expert in something who could do a really interesting and insightful blog. And so we have um, every member of the team blogs occasionally, um, but we also have uh, guest contributions from people. And I would encourage you to do that sort of thing. So the more that we can make connections with other people, then we become a much stronger cohort online. Uh, so that's great. And then um, perhaps now if we head to uh, encourage me at the end, because I can't do everything, so to show you. Um, so this is a resource on the site um, with material that's static. Well, it's not entirely static. We update it from time to time. Um, but the idea is about particular issues that people might feel um, very particularly about stress came up earlier when Albert was speaking, and I think it really is, it's hard to meet someone who isn't feeling stress of some kind at the moment. And when we put this page up, and it was written, uh, I believe, by Dr. Ian Jamison, who's writing this week, um, and it was in February, and the, the hits on that page was incredible in terms of anything we've done um, on the site in recent times. Um, it really struck a chord with people. Um, and then issues, of course, to do with things like bereavement people looking for guidance or um, perhaps feeling calling um, on this site at Squash, but that should be romance, intimacy, and heartbreak. Uh, because again, the church doesn't always talk about some of these things. Um, if we hop back to the home page for a second um, and scroll down, um, you'll see various features. If we go slightly back up, sorry, I was a wee bit too keen there. Um, this is uh, news, so we'll see various news things coming past. We don't need to click on it just now, that's fine. Uh, our latest podcast, oh, there we go, here's our news. Uh, um, so it gives you wee nuggets of information about stuff that's going on. Um, and then our latest podcast comes up here, but when you click listen more um, on the side, that would give you many more podcasts. And that's something we want to do more of, because um, as I say, we don't have a lot of audio content. Um, in very West Parish Church, uh, we prayer point about them there. Um, and if we just scroll down slightly further, um, we'll see things. This is a new module on the site we're just trialing, um, which is um, letting people know things that are coming up on the site. Um, but that's just to give you a bit of an idea of some of the things that are on the site and um, some ways of experiencing the, the content. I think that's everything that I was going to tell you about just now. As I say, I can't go through everything, but it should give you an idea of the range of resources that are available. Um, so as I say, at any point, if your church wants to, uh, or your community wishes to use uh, any of these resources, then they are most welcome to. But also you might see something we've done and think, well, we can have a go at that. Um, uh, so for instance, this feature this month where we're asking um, our writers to choose a song and write about it, that's maybe something you could do. And uh, you could do a wee gig at the same time, perhaps invite some people to do some songs. So continuing in the spirit of creativity and sharing our um, experiences and sharing what we have to offer, I'd like to invite Alan, uh, Alan Harrow, um, who's part of the tech team at Inverry West, um, uh, to come forward. And if I can just locate the microphone. Thank you. Lovely stuff. So, Alan, <laughs> thank you so much for having us here. I was, thank you, thank you. I was wondering, um, first off, because we've talked a lot about streaming today, if you could tell us a wee bit about your experience of streaming here at Inverary West Church and when you started and what that's been like. Most um, Sundays, it's fairly relaxing. I'm going to break with just what James has said at the moment, and I'm going to turn to the main camera here and say, Hello to Jim Buchan and Fiona Penny, who have been speaking to regularly in the last uh, hour or so. And Jim has been watching us in his phone, feet beat their head, and I believe he's now back in Kemney, which is about five miles as a crow flies, uh, with all sorts of suggestions back and forth with each other. 
What was your question again? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, your street's ahead of me, Alan. It's just ahead. <laughs> uh, was it stressful? How, how, how do well, we yeah, what, so how long have you been doing it right. and, and what's, we, what's it been like? Really a bit of history about Inverurie West. Before my time, so I was a young guy, back in 1999, we took the big decision to jump with the Church of Scotland and consider church without walls. So I like to think as a congregation we've been fairly progressive. So you're all sitting on what was an empty space before, uh, obviously downstairs, moved the sanctuary upstairs, created the hospitality area down there, meeting rooms, so we're here for whatever people wish. The reason that happened was the biggest risk the congregation identified at the time was doing nothing. Yeah. So doing nothing. So we did this uh, at great cost and uh, everybody worked together. So I guess on from that is now what we've done with the live streaming. Uh, Mark's been a, a kind of leading light. We've got a team of eight people that help um, on a kind of weekly basis. And the installation, we were lucky to get funding from the Go For It, uh, which really helped us. That was really good. We, that was installed in January. The first uh, live was the 14th of January. Copies are still available uh, and can be signed. Um, <laughs> and we've kind of grown from there. Being inclusive is really important to us. Um, and there are a few organisations around Inverurie, as you can imagine. We are well covered with uh, care homes, nursing homes, and Benny View, which is an NHS uh, run organizations. We have a team of people who sit on a Sunday morning with people from Benny View and enjoy hopefully the service and people who were maybe regular church goers. And that works both ways. So as well as having someone who has been to church a lot, one guy I can think of in particular who was always first in and sat in about the third back row there. Um, he's now there and now feels when he's actually enjoying the service on Sunday he's here. At one point he'd remarked, and Rona's smiling because she knows what's coming, um, he'd actually said to one of the people who was there with him, she hasn't shaked hands with me today. Yeah. Now you can think that's negative, but actually in his mind he feels he was here. Mm. And that's important to us. Mm. You know, that's really important mm. to us. Oh, I've probably waved way off the... No, the no, you're fine, you're back. fine. It's really interesting. How about once you got set up, once you got up and running, what were some challenges perhaps that you faced that you maybe couldn't predict? You know, not so much the money and so on, but... I think there's probably a fear. One of us, Mark, had experience of video mixing before. And a bit like what Jim had spoken about, thinking, oh my goodness, what's going to be happening here? And there's still an element of that, you sitting behind there thinking, I push this button, I'm opening myself to the world. <laughs> Good. So training, getting used to it, um, sighting where the cameras actually are in the church. Somebody spoke earlier about um, the area over here is where we say to people they can sit if they don't want mm. to be filmed. That's never been an issue. No one has ever mentioned it. I think it's more of, well, is this hat okay? Where will I sit? Is that the camera? And that type of thing. Not in a bad way, but people have welcomed it and it's, and it's worked yeah. really well. So, persuading the congregation in the session, well, with the go for it funding, the session rolled over. That was okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's always a help. Um, <laughs> the congregation, well, they have to learn from that as we, we learned as we went along, how we're going to use it, mm. what was going to be happening with it. Baptisms, I must, uh, Rona does the baptism, it was this central area here, a kind of oval shape, which is ideal for where we have the main cameras and young couples, families, I love that, uh, mm. and it's something that's there, but it also allows people who for various reasons, couldn't make whatever is happening here, whether it be a baptism or a funeral, to be part of it. Mm. And, that, and that's quite key. So it's back to that word again, uh, inclusive. And mm. that's, that, that's quite important to me. And uh, it's quite important to the team, uh, us all at the West. Absolutely. It works well. I'm really glad you said that, actually, touching on that specific issue, because one of the things we haven't talked about so much today is the fact of people who, who would like to come to church, who would like to participate, but just can't, you know, and there's all sorts of reasons why people might have ill health or be older or work shifts or, or have various other commitments. And Even people who might be in hospital for a short term period, uh, an operation or whatever, via their phone or their tablet, 
uh, we have people who are very much involved in the congregation who were in New Zealand for a month, managed to watch the service even though it's been midnight and one o'clock in the morning. <laughs> I'm sure I would have done the same. Um, <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. <laughs> I'm not sure if that is, I'm frightened what the best, uh, but, but it's so great. So you can watch it from New Zealand, you can watch it from anywhere. It's, uh, it's, and it's a great it's thing to, to be able to offer as a community, the fact that, you know, Granny in Australia can watch the baptism too. You know, she can, exactly. if, she can if she's got the stamina to stay up, you know. I think it's more than just inclusive. There's probably a better word for it, but anybody who has had a family event, whichever might take in the church, and the mere fact you can't be there for whatever reason, really quite important that you can be there somehow via technology. Mm. If that's live at the time via a live link or later on, but you can still experience it. Mm. And we've done two ways as well. So I'm back to the Benihi View where we sang happy birthday to someone who was in there as well. It's nice. It's quite... Mm. Oh, that's lovely. <laughs> we didn't yeah. invite people down, but you know, it's never a shortage of people to sing. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I was just wondering as well, um, it was great how you uh, referenced some of the folks that are joining us online that are watching, um, and I was wondering how your experience of being more prolific online, so there's the sharing the webcasts, but also you know the stuff happening on Facebook and internet, how that's kind of changed right. the community or expanded. I kind of thought you were going to go that way, so Mark, very quickly, in the last five minutes, check the up-to-date figures. So these are, I feel so there should be a drum roll at the end of Strictly when I'm announcing the, the, the figures. And I wish you hadn't them in the side, but never mind. Um, regular followers on Facebook with 180. So uh, that, uh, that's really good. Twitter with 64. 2,900 folk hit the web um, over the last period. And YouTube, we've got 25 subscribers. Now, on a weekly basis, we can see the figures up there. Uh, Earlier on, I think it peaked about seven or ten different places watching us. Uh, during the normal service, it, it's up to about ten. But then watching during the week, mm -hmm. now it's either Ron or it's me, but we're hitting it quite a lot. So it's, it's like between 50 and 170 re-watches right. during Fantastic. the week. Yeah. So that's important, mm -hmm. important to us. A bit of figures, but, you know, I wouldn't get hung up in the figures because then I, I used to be a data cruncher. So I would then be producing graphs and say, well, we've got to do better here, folks. Tuesday isn't any good. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. you know, it's, it's managing what you've got. Definitely. Yeah. And I think you just need to take a look at, you know, social media and stuff at the moment to see what happens if you just pursue the figures uh, at the cost of anything well, else. You know. It's the unknown ones. Uh, there's a lady called Sue in Edinburgh who has started watching regularly. And in a way, we now feel, I hope she's maybe watching a bit or maybe say hello just in case. But she could be part of our church family now, or the church family. Mm. So you just, you never know who, you, who, you're, who you're actually involving mm. and who wants to be involved. Mm. Is, there, is there anything else that you particularly wish to add? <laughs> I'm trying to take no, care just to where you've got your notes there. I, I think you can get hung up in the tech. And I think it's important maybe to look at what we have there and think, whoa, that looks a bit much. Like Jim's idea of keeping it simple with a couple of... But then you get to the point where you think, I want the broadcast the quality. And some of the kind comments we'll have today about has been the quality. Um, and we can go fairly close in and keep high definition. And it's kind of important. Um, but then if you're watching on a small phone, it's maybe neat. Yeah, it's, it's there. We just use it the best we can. Training and keeping people interested is maybe a challenge. Mm. But the highlights of the feedback and knowing that we are being as inclusive as we possibly can and try to engage as many people as we can, mm. very important. Mm. Mm. So what would, you, what would you say if there's a church or a representative of a church here today that's not sure about whether to invest in the digital technology? What would you say? I think they should get in touch with Sanctuary first. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't tell them. To I'm say not that. sure. I didn't they, tell them I'm not sure. Maybe Albert will answer. Are you can what the current situation is with funding? For instance, the go for it funding. But we found that uh, during our first pitch at what we would have liked to go through to it, which was probably only a period of eight weeks. I'm looking for Mark the nod or shake. The prices Big came. Nod. The prices Big came nod. down. So we didn't overspend, but the go for it funding covered the expense. 
and we put in the, not only the video but also a new sound desk as well. The prices are always coming down. Mm. Technology is getting greater. So it's really, don't be frightened of it. Really don't be frightened of it. Um, it's anybody can kind of do it. And there is expert, uh, I've lost, uh, is there, Neil. It, it's getting that, maybe a little bit of expertise just to help you along the way. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I was just, you preempted me. Uh, wonderful, wonderful people here today. I was going to ask uh, if we could have a wee round of applause um, to thank Alan for contributing, but also Mark at the back. Because one thing that we've not thought maybe a huge amount about is that the often really thankless task it can be doing technical stuff in a building. Because people tend to notice the sound when it goes wrong. And people tend to notice the visual stuff when it doesn't connect. And they don't notice all those many times um, that things just go swimmingly. Um, so I would like us to have another round of applause to thank Alan and Mark, but also Mike and everyone here. OK, so. We're going to rapidly move on now to my final C, my final C, which is connectivity. Digital technology multiplies our connections and gives us many new means of experimenting, innovating and collaborating, allowing us to stretch and challenge ourselves without compromising who we are. Patterns of church attendance might be changing but we have an unprecedented opportunity to increase church engagement by freeing up church from the confines of an hour every Sunday and instead be with people in countless new ways throughout the week. I believe that we have a calling to use the internet in a manner full of grace, offering quiet, humane places of rest online. We can offer sanctuary to people who need it. We can show that faith is a living thing. Sometime it's, it's something, is the word, something you can walk with and wrestle with all the time in often little quiet moments that catch you unawares. It's these moments that are often the most significant in our faith. We should never underestimate little moments. We should never underestimate how things can change in an instant. In The Wounded Healer by Henri Nouwen, he speaks wonderfully about moments of genuine connection. He writes about the life-changing moments when people feel that they are recognized and affirmed. The Wounded Healer was written in the 1970s when the internet was just in its infancy, probably in a secret lab somewhere. But the internet, with its limitless ability to create small moments, with its ability to create wee moments that people can read or watch or listen to when they're ready, when they need it, offers wonderful opportunity for recognition, for people to say, that's what I thought. All right, I never looked at it like that before. I'd like to quote a chunk of uh, Henri Nouwen's The Wounded Healer for you when he's describing these moments of connection between people. He writes, in this context, pastoral conversation is not merely a skillful use of conversational techniques to manipulate people into the kingdom of God, but a deep human encounter in which a man is willing to put his own faith and doubt, his own hope and despair, his own light and darkness at the disposal of others who want to find a way through their confusion and touch the solid core of life. In this context, preaching means more than handing over a tradition. It is rather the careful and sensitive articulation of what is happening in the community so that those who listen can say, you say what I suspected, you express what I vaguely felt, you bring to the fore what I fearfully kept in the back of my mind. Yes, yes, you say who we are, you recognize our condition. And now in here is writing about moments where two people are present. And that's incredibly important. And none of the digital technology should be about replacing connections between two individuals that are present. But it gives us the opportunity to discover what can happen when people connect in new ways and when they have new opportunities to connect to things. It's these moments of connection. The internet gives us the opportunity to sensibly articulate what is happening in the community. It gives us a way of allowing people to feel recognized. 
And I don't just mean by streaming a whole service. It could be a short prayer. It could be a little podcast. It could be a 500-word blog. Something that someone says that just articulates what people have felt but haven't been able to say. We can be vulnerable, humble witnesses online. People who are willing to articulate what is vaguely felt or fearfully kept at the back of the mind. The internet gives us the opportunity, outside of a formal setting, to state simply and clearly the life-changing word of, words of God, read afresh in a new age, right in the midst of people's lives. We can reach people exactly where they are. They don't have to turn up. They don't have to come. They don't have to get out of bed. Perhaps they're exhausted on the bus ride home. Perhaps it's 3 a.m. and they can't get to sleep. Perhaps they're on a lunch break of a job that they just hate. Or they're standing outside of hospital with one cigarette and no hope. And we can be there. If we're there and we're online, then we can help them in those moments, precisely when people need it most. I referred earlier to six degrees of separation, that you're not likely to be more than six degrees or connections away from anyone else in the world. We have an enormous potential to reach people if we continue to shore up these connections, if we continue to share. We can access people that would otherwise be missed if we all work together. And we foster a community that's open and offers many points of connections. These next words stopped me in my tracks when I read them five years ago, and they still haunt me. This, again, is from Nouwen's The Wounded Healer. He writes, let us not diminish the power of waiting by saying that a life-saving relationship cannot develop in an hour. One eye movement or one handshake can replace years of friendship when man is in agony. Love not only lasts forever, it needs only a second to come about. We don't need all the answers. We don't need an answer. We don't even need to have a clue. Sometimes we just need to wait upon the Lord. And who knows the power of something that we post could have. As Nowen says, it only needs an instant. Seriously, who knows what a tweet or a clip or a song or a prayer or a reflection that we post, what influence it will have. We have new opportunities to join God's work of redemption and restoration. And it takes only a second. A second to save a life, to transform a life, to bless a life. It's not for us to set the priorities or the timescales. We just wait upon the Lord, and the Lord is already online, because the Lord is everywhere, and the Lord is waiting for us. It needs only a second to come about. Dear God, use our seconds well. I would like us to pray now. And I would like to ask you to please ensure that your mobile phones are switched on. And could you please take your mobile phone out if you have your mobile phone with you? You may not have a phone and that's okay. You might have a tablet. You might have a, a, a laptop. Um, you may not have any digital device and well done you if you've managed to last this long without being hip close to your device. That's okay. If you don't have a device in front of you, just relax. Um, so what I would like to do now is lead us in a short interactive prayer. And don't worry, I'm not going to ask you to post anything. I'm not going to ask you to um, do anything um, outside, um, I would hope, of your comfort zones. The phone is just a tool for us to help us pray, to help us think in new ways about the technology. So I would ask you to get your phone, it's in front of you, and go to your home screen. Okay, so this might be the lock screen on your phone or it might be the wallpaper on the background. Normally you have an option to put a photo there. What's your screen background? Is it the picture of a loved one? A spouse? Maybe a child? Is it a beautiful landscape? Is it an attractive abstract picture? Maybe it's just the color blue. I don't know what's on your phone screen. But take a moment to thank God for what is in that picture or perhaps what it reminds you of. And then I'll just take a wee moment of quiet and then I'll move on to the next stage.
Now, could you open your calendar app? If you have a calendar or a diary, something like that on your phone, if you're not holding a phone right now, maybe you could imagine your diary picture, the pages in front of you filling up. Think about the appointments that you have coming up. Think of the people you will meet, your friends, family, colleagues. There are perhaps deadlines in there, projects to complete, events to prepare for. Take a moment now in the quiet to hand these things over to God for safekeeping. Now, would you open your contacts? And I'm not going to ask you to phone anyone or text anyone. Don't worry. Although if you feel like phoning someone or texting someone, you're welcome to. Could you open your contacts and scroll down to the letter C, seeing as I've been talking about C at the moment? Think about the person or organization or... Um, whoever it is that's the first one that comes up under the letter C. If you don't have a phone, just think of someone whose name begins with C. If you don't have anyone under C, just travel down to whoever is next. It might be, like for me, that it's a carpet company. That's okay. Embrace the serendipity. Take a moment to pray for that person. Embrace the serendipity and the spontaneity of inviting them into your prayer life. And again, we'll just briefly pause so that we can do that and lift that before God. Okay. I'll now ask you if you have an app on your phone or device um, which is a news app of some kind. It might be connected to a newspaper or it might be your phone or tablet's device. If you don't have a news app, you could go online and open up um, a news site that you perhaps visit on a regular basis. As I say, the idea here is to just be open to the surprise of the multiple connections. Don't worry about it precisely. Now, I'd invite you to look at the headlines and to just quickly tap on one, the first one that catches your eye. You don't have time to read the article or to take everything at the moment, but just open the app. I've got a news app here. Click. And then I would ask you in the quiet just to read the first paragraph of that news item and then bring whatever is being discussed in that news item before God in prayer. Okay, I would now invite you, um, when you're ready, uh, to open up an app on your phone that might be called Photos or Gallery, something like that, Pictures, wherever your images are kept on the phone. And to scroll through, and as soon as you see an image that particularly strikes you, perhaps it's a picture of a loved one again, or um, a recent experience you've had somewhere you've been, just open that image and again, use it as a stimulus, as a way of praying to God. You now return to the home screen and have a look at the time. Take a moment to think about how you use your time and how you prioritize it. Have a wee look at your battery life. Is it low? Is it full? Bear with me as we take a moment to pray for those with low energy. Pray for people who you know who may be struggling with issues of physical or mental health. Who, who do you know that may be run down currently?
And then if you wish to, you may want to lock your phone or put it down, put it beside you. Phones are not the be all and the end all. You may wish to close your eyes or do anything that makes you feel comfortable. And we'll just draw our time of prayer to a close. Dear God in heaven, we offer you our prayers, humble and heartfelt. Encourage us to use technology to bring people closer together and not to push them further apart. Encourage us to be more mindful in how we use it and lead us often to places of rest. Amen. Thank you very much for 